It is a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Jerry Kelly all the way from Marshall, Missouri. Is that a yeah. suburb of, or where's Marshall? It's, it's a rural. Town. It would be about 90 miles to the east of Kansas City. 90 miles to east Kansas City. Yeah. So Marshall was born at a very young age in Addison, Missouri, before the time of preschool, kindergarten, and sandboxes, spending the first nine years of his life on a small farm. Um, he invested... Five years before school, playing in the dirt, swinging on a tree swing, and throwing rocks at almost any target, moving or fixed. His family moved to the north central Missouri town of Marshall when he was nine. He started his formal education when he was five and graduated from UMKC School of Dentistry 19 years later. So you and I both graduated from UMKC Dental School. I was in 87. You were 10 years earlier in 77. Right. And um, he went back to Marshall, flat broke, but with no educational debt and having uh, been practicing general dentistry for the last 30 years. Thank you so much, Jerry, for uh, coming on my show because I still think one of the biggest problems in dentistry today is that every year we graduate 5,000 dentists and two-thirds of them go to the big cities, 117 metros where half of America lives, and only a third of them go to the 19,022 rural towns where the other half of America lives. Right. And, um, I mean, nobody needs to set up a dental office in San Fran, whether you're a dentist or an orthodontist, um, probably ever again for at least a decade. They just ought, ought to have a moratorium. I'm out here in Phoenix. Uh, Scottsdale is insane. I mean, if, if you want to practice, if you graduate and say, I want to go to Scottsdale, that, that should be able to commit you to an insane asylum, you know. <laughs> um, so what's it like? Uh, so I want to get you on there. What's it like in the rural? Um real relaxed um i guess as far as dentistry is concerned i guess i could tell you a story not too long ago there was a young dentist that's working here a couple of days of the week satelliting from kansas city i called him up he'd ask him if he'd like to go out to lunch and he said sure so we went out to lunch and chatted and stuff and as we were leaving he kind of looked at me and said well, what do you want to talk about and i go nothing and he looked at me and, and said like really and i go yeah i said no, I just wanted to have you out for lunch. And he said, this would have never happened in Kansas City. So it's, people get along better. People look out for each other more. Uh, it, for kids, I like it because you have the opportunity to watch your kids growing up, watch them be involved in school. You get to know their teachers better. So you can kind of subconsciously keep a little bit better track of them. Um, the educational systems out here are, in my opinion, very good. Uh, the Marshall School District has what's called an A-plus program, which in Missouri, the first two years of college, if they want to go to a community college, is paid for. It's literally free. And so it basically cuts the cost of a college education in half, which I think is really significant. Um, things like that. And the education is just fine, too. My two daughters, one did her undergraduate at Northwestern and is now a um, associate legal counsel for United Missouri Bank in Kansas City. The other one is in her first year at the osteopathic uh, med school in Kansas City. So just to say rural towns don't provide good educations, I highly disagree with. That, that is a, uh, that, that is, a, why do you think kids won't go out to rural? I mean, the military will pay these kids $85,000 and get them to go sit in Afghanistan, Iraq, North Korea, out in the middle of an aircraft carrier, six months without touching dirt. Why won't they go where they're needed? I mean, rule number one in business is go where they ain't. How come kids won't go where they ain't? I would, and this is just a guess, but all of the dental schools, or most of the dental schools, are located in larger areas. And that's kind of a critical time in a lot of these kids' lives, and they either get used to that environment, meet someone there that they want to spend their life with or something like that, and they just have a tendency to migrate that way, I guess. I don't know. Uh, my oldest daughter uh, lives in Kansas City and loves it downtown. They uh, have everything like that. Me, uh, it, it's just so great, five minutes anywhere in town. Uh, Something else is uh, that I really like about it is where that the people really look out for you. Um, when we built our office, there was an underground spring right next to the office, and the contractor said, you need a couple sump pumps just to keep the water from building up. I said, that's fine. And one of them dumps out onto the street, and I bet we'll have patients or people stopping here once in a while and say, hey, Doc, you got a leak out there. Did you know that? It's just for the 
you know, the courtesy to come in and say, look out for you and, and things like that. It's just wonderful. I've had uh, uh, police officers come by at night when I'll be up there working and knock on the door and say, everything okay, doc? You know, they just, they just check out, look out for you and stuff like that. Uh, it's just safer and more comfortable for me. That is so cool. And um, you also, there's lower overhead in rural and there's uh, less PPO signage. I mean, a lot of uh, these guys in the big cities, 85% of their patients are on a PPO, and they don't realize they're doing almost all of this at cost because they, they sign up for a PPO, which drops the fee 35 to 40%, and usually that's just all your profit dollars. So right. you end up doing the filling for free. Um, right. Are you a member of all these PPOs out there in the rural? The only PPO that I belong to is Delta Premier, Delta Dental Premier. Uh, that's the only one that uh, that we're involved with. Uh, a lot of people, I think, don't understand that there's not a lot of difference, at least out in the rural areas, between what the PPO will pay and what they'll pay the non-participating providers. Most of the preventive procedures are still at 100%. The only difference is you get 100% of your own schedule instead of 100% of the insurance company's reduced schedule. Um, it hasn't been a problem for us. Yeah. And again, I think part of that may be because, well, Marshall has, um, well, probably I would say three and a half dentists full-time. You've got uh, two full-time dentists and three that work here part-time. So when you have a town of 13,000 and basically three and a half dentists, um, it uh, makes things a lot easier. So what, what, you've been doing this for, uh, it'll be 40 years for you, uh, it'll be 30 exactly. years for me, 40 years for you. Exactly. Um, you're, you're talking to a lot of kids right now. Um, podcasting huh. is far more popular in the 30 and under crowd uh, right. than the 50 and older crowd. What, sure. what, 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 what advice would you give these kids? You know, I was thinking about that and, you know, when you don't know something, you go to some people that do. And what I did was I contacted a couple of young dentists and also a, a uh, young lady that's applying to dental school to see what their perspective on the thing was. And um, so it's okay, I'll share that with you. Uh, we'll start with the youngest one first. The, the young lady that was applying for dental school was fairly intelligent. She's from Marshall. Uh, I don't know if you want names or not, but uh, anyway, uh, Abby uh, didn't make it in. And, and she graduated from college in three and a half years for her first year in dental school. And sometimes that's enough to... Uh, you know, break their will or something like that. She dug her heels in and is working. She's going to improve her DAT and uh, get some more classes. The thing that uh, she sent me a little note and the uh, last sentence really sums it up. Uh, she said that uh, I'm going to keep trying until I receive the acceptance letter of my own. I never realized how challenging this process would be, but if it wasn't, the people we call our dentists wouldn't be the people they are today. That's pretty perceptive for a 21, 22 year old young lady. And uh, that's the kind of people that I want to see uh, in dentistry. Um, another young man, uh, Joe Kelly, he's no uh, relation to me, practices in Boonville, Missouri, and he's actually done a lot of the things that you keep preaching on, which so you'll be glad to hear that. He lives in Columbia, which is 120,000 people drives 30 miles to Boonville, which is a town of about 8,300, and uh, he's, uh, he graduated from the University of Iowa 2013. It's his second career. He was a physical therapist for, uh, at first, but, uh, and his advice was, uh, he, he strongly recommended a, a general practice residency for the first year out, and he said, be picky. Don't just pick one but interview several. He said the one that he had, he literally worked his tail off. He did probably in that year about 800 extractions, 30 to 40 implants, and about 30 to 40 IV sedation cases. Um, like he said, he worked his tail off, but he said it was very valuable. He felt that it was worth the equivalent of two or three years of private practice. So that would be something I think that uh, would be a good takeaway from this. He said several of his classmates went either to military or Indian Health Reservations Reserves not many did the corporate route uh, from his point of view. I asked him what was uh, some things that he wasn't expecting when he moved into private practice, and he said uh, 
the rejection, when people don't accept your treatment plan and things like that. Uh, and I, I realized that, yeah, when I was first out too, you kind of get that, well, why don't they? And uh, everything, but that's part of it. You have to do that. And the other thing he said was that, and he just finished uh, closing the deal to buy this practice within the last few months, is that you're going to spend more than 40 hours a week on a dental practice if you're the owner of it, at least getting it up and running. So uh, that was some pretty good uh, insights from him. The other gentleman, Kyle Lisenby, is from Columbia. Kyle's been practicing about 10 years, so he can kind of look back with a little bit more depth of uh, knowledge on some things that have worked and haven't worked for him. Um, one of the things that he said was that uh, digital impressions were really, he felt worth it. He said it, uh, he wished he'd have done it five years ago. So when someone from 10 years looks back on that, you can kind of put some value on that. Uh, he loves intraoral cameras. You keep asking people, you know, do you need a CBCT? Do you need a CAT, you know, uh, all this stuff. He said that uh, for him, an intraoral camera was a real plus as far as patient education, documenting stuff for insurance and stuff like that. His only regret is that he wished he had one for every room. So uh, I think that was a, a, a good insight that he had. Um, some things that he said that were easier than he actually thought were negotiating a lease and uh, getting the money from the bank, um, which was a good thing. Some of the things that he said were more difficult was uh, staff turnover. And Columbia is kind of a, a transient city to a certain extent. The university's there and you have a lot of people coming and going, young people and stuff like that. And it was a challenge for him to keep his uh, practice full. Now his practice has two owners and four dentists, so it's pretty fair size. But to keep well-trained staff available was uh, a, quite a challenge for him. Uh, it was also much easier for him to get his continuing education as far as traveling is concerned before he started his family. Uh, they now have three little children and uh, I see them Sunday at church a lot and they're great kids but three kids is well you know you had f what four and uh, so it's it's uh, it's time well spent but it does take time and he felt that, that a lot of the in-person lectures had more value to him than some of the online things from that point of view. Um, and again, some things that you preached, and I think it probably, you know, you can say stuff to your blue in the face, but when you get a young kid 30 years behind you saying, yeah, he's right, I think it really ends a lot of credence to it. And one thing that Kyle mentioned was to get business savvy, you know, learn how to read your uh, business reports and uh, stuff that you didn't get in school at all, but you really need that business and people savvy for uh, not only employees, but for patients. So those are some ideas, none of which are mine, but I think that they were pretty valuable uh, for some people as far as for young graduates and stuff like that. I think um, a great way to learn accounting is, you know, you're always good at whatever you're interested in. Like, you know, like if you're really interested in elk hunting, you know everything about it. And if I'm really right. interested in bowling, but buy if you just buy one share of each publicly traded dental stock company, they mm -hmm. have to mail you their 10Q quarterly reports and their 10K annual report. So uh -huh. you so you so you get practice of reading a profit and loss statement, a balance sheet, a statement of cash flow, and you're interested because it's all. Like if you bought uh, Patterson's stock, they're talking about their Serac machine and their CAD cam and digital uh -huh. impressions and all that kind of stuff. Ba back to residency, I want to thing um, I've noticed in the residency since we've been out thirty or forty years is that um, the kids who do residencies in big cities in the poorest part of town seem to just get the most massive part experience. But if they go to like a little VA hospital and it's kind of an upper class, more rich area. They just uh -huh. don't see the volume of cases, and and I've noticed also like uh, where I'm from, Kansas, they moved the uh, the uh, resident hospital from Little Lawrence, Kansas, uh -huh. over to uh, Big Wichita, Kansas, which has ten times as many people uh -huh. because they just say you get ten times the weird and bizarre cases if you go, you know. Right. So yeah, I, I would want to do a residency in the biggest poorest area I could find. <laughs> you know, I think that's that's I. That, that's tremendous advice, uh, and gosh darn, etch it in stone and give it to every kid when they graduate. That's really true. 
I believe. Yeah, and a year in the military, you know, the military's got a more narrow population. I mean, it's mostly young boys needing uh, fillings and wisdom teeth out. Right. And as far as you talked about the rejection, um, I, I think young people, you know, when you're little, your parents and uncles are these great people and everything. But as you get older and older, I think you um, are more peaceful as you get older and realize that all these legendary people in your family are just crazy monkeys and you just the, the the more you lower your expectations on people seems like the happier you are they don't let you down you know you realize i mean it's uh it, it's amazing going to a friend family reunion look at all these 75 year old uncles and you just say okay they're, they're all just just all you know they're they're really not different than a 10 year old they're just uh crazy monkeys um but i i, I agree with that digital impressions i think the um, the, uh, and even the intro camera, the, the easiest way to increase your quality is magnification. Whether you go from naked eye to loops, whether you go from um, reading that impression is nothing compared to scanning it and seeing on a computer. You know, you're a prep 40 times larger. There's no way a dentist can see that scanned impression and not go back and pick up the drill and smooth something out, change something. I mean, right. I've had the uh, good fortune of practicing. My brother's been my lab technician for 30 years, and he studied under Gordon Christensen's technician, John Archibald, who is a wizard with his hands and his own and stuff like that, and which is, really has been an education for me. I mean, kids can't do it now. It's, it's virtually impossible to do, but uh, kind of drawing parallels, we had a 10-power dissecting scope down in his lab, and anytime he would have any questions, you know, I would get this clothespin up there that basically says, hey, big boy, come down and look at this. And it's so great having that there because when you see that where you're talking about either 40 times or even 10 times, it makes an imprint in your mind. And when you're doing the same thing on a tooth, you remember that. So it, it is an education and uh, everything. But having him around, not as you know, in addition to be a, a great friend, has just been a tremendous education for me in the lab aspect of things. You know, when you started this show, you talked about how you wanted to just go to lunch with another dentist. And he was like, well, what do you want to talk about? And you're just like, well, you're, you're a dentist. I mean, look, I don't want to talk about anything. I, 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 I noticed so much in my own backyard that, you know, when I was a little kid and got out of school at 24 and when I went my problems, you know, I was so excited to meet all the other dentists. You run across the street like, hey, you know, we're, we're on the, in the same dental fraternity. And half of them did not like that, viewed it as competition and had ruffled feathers and, you know, blah, blah. And the, uh, they, they thought in fear and scarcity. And the other uh -huh. half were all like, yeah, let's go to a bar and watch a football game and, and, and you trade patients or you see someone, you think, oh, he can do it better or, or you know, just cover right. emergencies. And 30 years later, I'd have to say the ones who thought in fear and scarcity in any measurement, whether it's economics, fr you know, fun, whatever, um, uh, they had, I, I think, a fraction of as much of a rewarding career as the ones that thought in hope, growth, abundancy, and realize that, you know, yeah. when you're a dentist, your competition is them spending their money at the lake and going to Disneyland and buying big screens. And, you know, they always got money for an $800 iPhone, but they don't want to come up with $800 to get their, you know, tooth fixed. Yeah, being on the same tan is just, uh, that's, that's just huge advice. And, and it's just, um, it's sad when you walk into a medical dental building and there's eight dentists in the building and I go knock on each door, you know, trying to meet them all, trying to get them on dental town, um, watch them download the dental town app in person to see if there's any bugs or, you know, I've learned so much about uh, user friendliness by just watching a really smart dentist who got A's in calculus and physics, not be able to download the dental town app, you know, and because, <laughs> because something we didn't make it a, uh, um, but um, it's amazing how almost every one of those practices I ask them, When's the last time you went to lunch with anybody in this building? And almost every single time, it's, I've never gone to lunch with anybody in this building ever. Wow. And it's like, that's just so sad. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and there are fewer dentists around here, and they have study clubs, you know, like 30 miles away and stuff like that, and I'll go to those. But, um, yeah, I, I do miss the, the dental if there'd be one slight disadvantage to the smaller town is you don't have as many dentists around to, uh, you know, talk shop with. And I'm just kind of anal about that. I, I, I love dentistry. You know, I mean, uh, my oldest daughter, I never thought about it, but she said that, uh, I'll probably be dead within a year of when I quit dentistry. And I go, what do you mean? And she said, you're not going to quit until you literally can't do it. And for me, I, I just, I just like it. 
you know. And what do you, and what do you, what do you like about it? Why? So in our um, our profession is not any different than the people that live in in the the country. Like uh, eighteen percent of dentists will get treated for uh, inpatient substance abuse, but eighteen percent of Americans will. Um, it's not um, burnout, you know, what whatever. What, what what do you what do you, why do you think you like it? Why why do you think you avoided all the uh, the burnout, the depression, all all that stuff? Um, probably a couple things. One is uh, physical exercise, which you probably found out too. That it's just uh, it's been proven that your body can't tell the difference between emotional stress and physical stress, and if you stress your body physically enough, you build a tolerance up to different kinds of stress. So things, and I'm sure age has something to that too, that things don't bother me as much now as they used to. But uh, one of my uh, running buddies, probably one of my best friends, he's an internist that's a year younger than I am and an amazing individual, still practicing 40 hours a week. This morning we met at the track at five o'clock, you know, for a workout. And uh, uh, in addition to that, he'll run they have a, an apartment in the city, and he'll run 40 to 45 5Ks a year, all under 22 minutes. I mean, he's amazing, but he practices what he preaches. And, but not only that, it's someone that uh, I've learned a lot of medicine from, but also uh, you just can vent and get things out of your uh, head and talk with it. So I think that you know, part of that stress relief has something to do with it. Uh, another thing, and I've heard people talking uh, on some of your podcasts about back issues and things like that, our local Y has a series of machines, and I'll try to make it through those about two or three times a, a week, not necessarily for to build a bunch of strength or something like that, but to keep the flexibility, especially the upper back and upper body. Um, and I've been just pretty darn fortunate with uh, being able to work uh, all the time. I must have picked my parents well or something. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question correctly there. So, so you, you think a lot of avoiding the, um, the stress, the burnout, you know, drinking, you know, Listerine between patients <laughs> is um, getting up at 5 o'clock and, and uh, doing physical exercise. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do that at least uh, four days a week. And, uh, and you got to eat healthy too. You can't eat a lot of junk. And for me, um, my behavior is such that uh, I'm – kind of obsessive compulsive and that's one of the reasons I signed on Dentaltown way back in 2002 and I had quickly realized that I need to get away from this because I would spend forever on there just because there's so much information. Now, I've recently kind of gone back to the dark side and started uh, doing a few posts and stuff like that but I try to limit myself. Part of it's my, my uh, uh, personality, my makeup. I started doing implants when I was 60. Um, I was just interested in that and finally felt enough about it to, to get going and um, everything. But it, there's just so much dentistry is changing, improving. It's just a challenge. I, I can't see how people could get bored with that, but I guess some of them do. Uh, not so me. you're surgically placing implants now? Yes. And you started at 60? Yeah. You want to hear the weirdest uh, implant surgical placement story I ever heard in my life? I was lecturing out in um, and California, LA, Anaheim, uh, wherever that stadium is. And uh, this 92 year old dentist came up to me. He was the only known survivor of Auschwitz concentration camp. And he, um, well, he's, when he turned 90, he decided that um, everybody kept saying, You're going to retire, you retire, retire. And so at 90, he bought a CBCT and started placing implants. And this guy is probably only about 5'3", and he was just a firecracker telling me <laughs> how he's never been this excited in his life. And his uh, young assistants who had been with him for 30, 40 years, you know, they were all like <laughs> 75. And they were all sitting you know, I had a whole bunch of 75-year-old ladies telling me he is so excited about these CBCTs. And I just thought, man, that is just amazing. So, so you start placing them. Yes. Well, talk about that journey because a lot of these kids are, you know, they come out of school and a lot of um, a lot of dentists um, come out of school and they feel bad because they feel like they didn't learn enough this or learn about right. that. And I, I tell them, you're you're going to think that way every day the rest of your life. I mean, thirty years out of school, you're thinking, man, I don't know enough about sleep apnea or I don't know enough about bone grafting. I mean, it's always something, and you uh -huh. can't learn all. But talk about talk to this kid. How do you go from walking out of school and never place an implant to placing your own implant? What what how how does that work, journey work? How did you do it? Uh -huh. 
I started with uh, the small diameter implants. The first thing I did was went to uh, Gordon Christensen's uh, seminar. At the time, it was called uh, small diameter implants. I think it's now uh, implant one. I went to that, and uh, one of the two core sponsor people that were there, representatives there, was uh, 3M, and it just so happened that the local uh, 3M rep lived 30 miles from me here in Marshall. Uh, and Well, he lived in Sedalia. But so I kind of lined up with them, went to a couple of the 3M implant courses, all for uh, edentulous cases, which seemed to be the, you know, the small diameter implants seemed to be a little simpler. I thought I'd start that way. Uh, after those courses and placing a few small diameter implants, I decided to go to Dr. Christensen's second course on implants, which was more of the uh, main size uh, root form implants. And he always has about four or five mentors in the back, people that have been through his full continuum that are just practicing dentists that have good advice and stuff. And one of them said, you know, you really need to go to a hands-on place or course in Mexico or someplace like that if you want to do the root form implants. So uh, at the time, Glidewell had a program. I signed up for it and went down to uh, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. They kept us pretty busy didn't even see the sunlight until the last day. Um, and then I actually took another hands-on implant course from uh, Michael Worley in uh, Texas called the Worley Implant Immersion Course, where uh, you go down to uh, Puebla, Mexico, which is about an hour or two south of Mexico City. The thing I like about Michael's course was that you had six or seven people there the first course with Glidewell, they just told you where to put the implant and what implant to put in. Michael went through all of the patients that you were, everyone was seeing and with the plans. So you really looked at, even though you may have put like eight or 10 implants in, you were looking at 50 different cases, which through three days was uh, real educational for me. Uh, then the other thing that I've done was he had also a, a sinus lift course this last uh, January that uh, we went to and uh, used to be like when we were in school, man, you lived in fear of getting into the sinus and, uh, and things like that. So it was nice kind of stretching my comfort zone from that aspect on those. But uh, that's kind of where I am now. Uh, I've got a periodontist, Bruce Ringdahl in Columbia that I've asked him to mentor me. So far I haven't imposed on him too much, but it's nice to have a specialist that wants to, to help out and stuff as well. So you were placing the, uh, the 3M mini implant, that's the uh, MDI, the mini dental implant. Is that the MTEC system? Yes, although 3M discontinued it about uh, three or four months ago. And I the think MTEC? There's, there's, yes, they, they're, not carry, they're, they're out of the small diameter. They're out of the implant business completely as far as I know right now. 3M, 3M is out of the implant business. It is out. And... Uh, some other companies are picking up some of their uh, sizes and, and things like that. But uh, as far as I know, 3M is completely out of the business. And why do you think they're out of the business? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I get a, you know, from listening to some of what Dr. Christensen was speaking about is that 3M had their system. They weren't list willing to change it. And they dominated the market for quite a long time. And the changes that he was saying they needed was uh, they needed some, instead of all the implants being totally straight, you needed some angled implants uh, for like the maxilla where everything was uh, not perfectly straight and stuff like that if they wanted to stay competitive. And they chose not to do that. And I think with uh, the zest things coming on with uh, more angles of divergence, I think think they just decided they better quit while they were ahead. That's my guess. I, I don't really know for sure. 3M didn't call me and ask me. And Well, it's a very competitive market. I mean, there's 175 yes. systems. And there's a lot of movements like, uh, um, who is it, um, just bought a part of uh, Megagen. Um, you know, there's... Strawman. Strawman. And, uh, huh. you know, there's just, uh, you know, gosh, Dan Herr bought Noble BioCare and Implants Direct. And if someone's only doing implants and they're really, really big, I could see how that would be an enormous competitor. So if you're not making money on the deal, you probably got, right. you pro they probably had to get bigger or get smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be my guess, but gosh, I don't know. Yeah, amazing. Um, so what, um, a, 
a lot of people think they can't get training in the United States hands-on surgical, you know. Um, but what we've been noticing is that if you um, if you have a place, and th this is what happened in Arizona. So there's a, uh, a homeless shelter dental clinic called the Cass Institute. And, uh -huh. and um, these dentists, um, you know, have to go to Mexico. If you go to, uh, uh, if you go to um, Yuma, Arizona, and cross over to the Mexican border, there's some implant placement courses. Um, Aaron Garg has one out in Dominican Republic. There's several in Mexico and Brazil. But a lot of the, uh, a lot of the women dentists didn't feel safe going to right. these countries by themselves. And uh -huh. uh, so he went, to the, um, he went to the Arizona State Board of Dental Examiners and says, if a licensed dentist from another state comes to Arizona and they're only going to do these for free on homeless you know, vets, uh, can they have a temporary license? I mean, how would you say no to that? Yeah, and uh, I mean, could you imagine answering to the uh, the governor or the newspaper why you know somebody fully licensed in in Missouri can't come to Arizona and treat vets for free, and yeah. um, and since um, since he did that, um, now I've heard of uh, two or three other people so far um, mm -hmm. said the same thing. So I think implant training, and, you know, there's a lot of charity to be done at home, yes. and uh, you don't have you don't have to go to uh, you know another continent to to treat poor people. And I, I think these homeless shelters. Could just be a hotbed uh, for um, um, dental implant training. You know, if they have a dental chair, like the CAS has, I think uh, twelve chairs. They're really nice, and I mean, it's just ev everybody wins on that. Right. Yeah. You mentioned the fact that uh, you know there's a lot of homeless people around here, and I've done third world dentistry and gone on trips like that. Something that's always kind of bugged me is that you know around even locally. Uh, there are issues and one of the things I'd like to do one of these times is to be able to actually have just a clinic for if nothing else for kids I don't think any child should have to go to school with a toothache you know it just shouldn't be uh, but I just don't have enough time with uh, uh, you know taking care of my patients I don't want to pull the rug out from under them to do something like this one thing that a disadvantage to the more rural areas is it's just really tough to get associates or young people to come out here to practice dentistry and boy if I could do that there's just like so much of people you know just to give back to what uh, you know Marshall's been great to me and I just love to do something like that but uh, I keep working at it and maybe it'll work one of these days but uh, anyway I agree with you completely that uh, there's a lot of people that could use a lot of uh, help. Um Talk about um, when you set up a dental office. Um, you were talking about the guy in uh, Columbia has, um, you know, staff turnover issues. You said it was a more transient population. Um, what, what, what could you tell these young kids on? I mean, because you have a very successful office in, in a small town. And what, what, how does a kid come out of school and go from a trained uh, math, physics, chemistry, root canals, fillings, and crowns uh, to leading a team? Of running a, a business, and I, um, I also noticed a lot of the greatest businesses in the United States, uh, um, like like Walmart, started in Bentonville, Arkansas. I mean, people say, I mean, he pioneered the uh, the the re, the exchange. I mean, you buy. He said that uh, you know some lady, he sold a pair of shoes, some lady, and the heel came off, and she wanted her money back, and that's nobody did it that way. Sears, Kmart, J.C. no one, and uh, so he just did that policy. But then uh, uh, she. Uh, told his wife Helen about it at church that Sunday in a small town of 5,000. And Helen said, I don't care what they do in Dallas and Chicago. And, you know, this is Bentonville. And so he started taking uh, returns back. And then when the guy selling the shoes would come, he'd push that up to the supply chain. He said, you know, you sold me 10 pairs, but I'd take one of them back. That, that's your problem. It's not mine. It's certainly not my customers. I, um, and I, I, so I always have noticed, here's what I'm going to I've always noticed that a lot of the things – Big city consultants say, big city consultants recommend, some very successful million dollar practices do. They could never get away with that in a town of 5,000 because if you're in uh, Phoenix and there's 3.8 million people and you uh, upset 100 a month, you could upset 100 a month for 1,000 a, a years and still get new patients. But when you're in a town of your size, you sneeze on the east side of town. They say, "God bless you." On the west side of town, <laughs> I mean, you 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 live more under a microscope. There's far more transparency from a dentist in a town of five thousand than a dentist in L.A. Yeah, um, I think that a lot of uh, you know 
you hear a lot of pushing, you know, full mouth reconstruction and things like this. And, you know, we'll fix people up uh, one tooth at a time if that's what they need. I don't try to force anything to them. I, I give them the options and uh, say, um, you know, things like, this is going to be a problem. Do you want to have it happen out of your control or do you want to bring it into your control? I mean, I've never known a wisdom teeth to flare up at a good time. I've never known a teeth to break at a good time, but if you want to wait, that's fine. Um, and sticking around and, and standing by your work, like you're saying, if something doesn't work, do it over. Don't charge the lab fee. Don't just do it right. Uh, that's what, uh, my uh, philosophy has been, uh, and don't, a lot of people around here at least have pretty good crap detectors. I mean, hate to say that, but they can know when you're trying to do something. And I just try to be honest with them. And another thing that we try to do is we have, a, I would say well over 50% of our patients have insurance, but to try to understand their insurance benefits and help them through that where they'll understand them. Because the average human, it's been in my experience, if they don't understand something, if they're financially responsible, they probably won't do it. If they don't care, they might. But uh, the people that want to make sure that they're going to be able to afford it and stuff like that would elect to defer some. So if we can work their insurance, and I'm not saying do anything that is illegal, but for instance, if you're doing an implant and they do have implant coverage, a lot of times you can maybe do the implant at the end of one year and do the restorative at the beginning of the next year, utilizing two years of implant for them and saving them a pretty fair amount of money, making it more affordable for them to do at the time. So learning what their insurance is and try to move alongside them and help them and not force anything down their throat. So your brother Kelly um, is uh, your lab tech. Right. So is that in the dental office? Is that in the yes. basement or how, how, how big a space is that? He's in the basement. He's got about, uh, let's see, I'd say 600 square feet down there. Uh, One man show? One man show, now, see, yeah. See, when I grew up in Kansas, um, that, that was common. I mean, my, my next door neighbor, Kenny Anderson, he had, a, you know, a guy in about this, uh, an area about size of an operatory, and it right. was down in the basement. Uh -huh. And uh, he'd take the impression, and the assistant would run it downstairs, and sometimes he'd run back upstairs. Um, <laughs> why, um, how, what kind of crowns does he do, and did you notice that a lot, was that a lot more common in your experience 40 years ago? than it is today uh, in 2016? Oh, sure. Um, I think that part of the what has driven the things to the CAD CAM milling and stuff like that is um, frustration with the quality of some labs that you get. Um, I, it seems like to me, again, a slight disadvantage of being in more rural areas, it seems like there's a geographic fit to some of the lab work you get back. In other words, the farther you are from the, the lab, the High, lower quality of fit it is and stuff like that, which is one of the frustrating things that brought uh, my brother, or we were able to get him together. He does, uh, we still do a pretty fair amount of cast gold, actually. Uh, does that, uh, we do the Emacs press porcelain and porcelain to metal. Uh, we do those things. He does all fixed. He doesn't do any removable prosthetics and stuff like that. And he works for a couple of other dentists uh, in the area as well. So does he want you to get cat, like CERAC or E4D? What, what, if you got a lab man right there, does, uh, what are your thoughts on getting that, scanning and him milling, shading, all that? Um, I doubt if he would, as a one man, I, he would, probably wouldn't go that route. Uh, he can press the Emacs, uh, you know, you can mill Emacs if you want to. The only thing that we're missing in the uh, whole scheme of things is uh, zirconia and for me, if I wouldn't need a zirconia, you know, you could, we could have a, another lab do that. Uh, but he doesn't, uh, has no desire to go to the, and it would, you know, being a small one-man office, uh, the expense of that, and he hasn't had much demand for it to this point. So there's really not a cost-benefit ratio there for him, which one thing, I think that that's something else that a lot of young practitioners would do is, you know, run like these CERAC machines or CAD CAM or something like that. What's it cost? What are you going to save and everything like that? Not just to buy it because that's the latest, greatest thing. So what percent of your brother's uh, business is you? Mm, I really haven't asked him that. Uh, I would guess 
Mm, ballpark a third. I could be off on that. Third. Ballpark and third. and yeah. for the third he does for you, what percent of that is uh, gold versus uh, Emax versus – does he still do any porcelain fused to metal? We do a little bit. Uh, sometimes if they really want porcelain to metal uh, or porcelain covered on a second molder, I, I will lean there uh, – just because it's a little tighter than uh, uh, Emacs. Or if we're doing a bridge or something like that, I still don't feel that comfortable with all porcelain in the posterior. Uh, so we're gonna have uh, porcelain in the metal. He does a lot with, uh, we do a lot of stress breakers from bridges uh, um, on the posterior and stuff like that. It just seems like they're less likely to come loose on that smaller abutment when we do those. And he's pretty good at those too. So uh, I would say 30 to 50% would be gold and then probably about that same ratio of Emacs and then maybe fill in with 10% porcelain to metal. And is your gold business... Um like, like I have seven restorations in my mouth. They're all gold. Mm -hmm. They're all gold cemented with zinc phosphate cement. Mm -hmm. And they'll probably be there, you know, when the Martians find us, you know, a million years from now. <laughs> um, what, is your gold um, work pretty much all going into men, or are you getting women to? Uh... It, we're getting some women, obviously men more so. Uh, and I'll just lay it out there and, and give them a choice. And we have the same fee for either one, even though the – uh, the lab expense of the gold is more just taking the cost off of the table. It's proven fact gold's going to last longer. It's the closest to the lifetime restoration we've got. The porcelain is going to look a little better. The question is this porcelain hasn't been out long enough. It looks good at this point. Is it going to start crumbling in 15 years? Is it, will it chip? Uh, will it wear? It's looking good at this point. At least the Emax is. Uh, as far as being kind on the other teeth, but we just don't know yet. So we're taking some aesthetic, something that looks good, but we're not really sure about long term, which some people, the appearance of gold doesn't, they don't care for it. Uh, I had a, a lady yesterday, she said, boy, I'd, I'd hate for gold to show on a second molar. And I just thought, I said, did you see it on mine? And she goes, no. And I opened my mouth and, you know, I've got gold crowns and onlays on all my first and second molars. And she goes, okay. So it's, but I'll do whatever they want to do as long as they understand the pluses and minuses to it. I, I, uh, if I want to enhance my appearance, I just turn out the lights. You know, I don't need to, <laughs> I don't need Emax crowns. Huh? Yeah. It's, it's funny. Uh, I, I guess it's just because, you know, women uh, decorate their entire body with gold ears, nose, ankles, rings, everything. But when it comes to teeth, uh, it's accenting a flaw. And they want to be flawless. Um, you know? Yeah, I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah. so they. Um, so what are you submitting your gold with? I'm using uh, Fuji Sim. And you like which, that? Yeah, I really do. It seems like we have virtually no post-operative discomfort from it, which the first la level of your uh, glass armors, the Ketac Sim and stuff like that, it seemed like there was a pretty fair amount of post-operative sensitivity to it. Retention's pretty good with it. Uh, if we've got something where it's really questionable, we'll use Multilink, uh, that uh, Ivoclar cement. Uh, but most of our, uh, and most of the studies have shown that if you get an adequate occlusal reduction on your Emax, uh, you can cement it with uh, Fuji Sim. And especially when you're getting down onto the roots and stuff like that, if you're using a resin cement, you're running a higher risk of recurrent decay around that. And that's something I don't want around my crowns if I can avoid it. So um, we dentists talk too much uh, dental stuff. We talk way too much about dentistry, root canal spellings. Um, you've kept Joyce in your office for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I always tell dentists, you know, the, you know, you're going you're gonna to make it or lose it in this business on all the soft stuff, the people stuff, the relationship stuff. You know, you hang on to your staff. You hang on to your patients. How do, why, what lesson did you learn, um, um, these young kids, how did you keep Joyce for 30 years? And then I also want to talk about the fact that when uh, kids go in and buy a practice, uh, they also find someone like uh, Joyce or somebody who's been there for 30 years uh, where they got a raise every time the earth went around the sun for 30 years. And they, they, they go buy this practice. They, they're looking at all the equipment. And then they look, at, they look at all these ladies who have been there for decades and say, my God, they, they make way too much money. I'm going I'm to fire them all 
and replace them all with uh, half the wages. What, what do you think would happen if you sold your practice uh, to some uh, lady that rolled into town? She's 25 years old. She looked at uh, Joyce and all those people have been there 30 years, say, I'll save me a bunch of money. I'll fire all of them, get new ones. How do you think that would go over in your town? Probably not well. Uh, I think that uh, any new person, again, small towns, you're kind of under the microscope. Um, I think it would be something that you would want to do with uh, some deliberation and uh, some definite, uh, that, I think that'd be a great place to get a consultant in to help with something. If, if you felt that you needed to do the changes and um, talk with the people about it and give them the chance, if, if say we're going to need to make these changes, you get the first shot. Can you do it? Do you want to do it? Then uh, if they say yes, no, or they say, well, you know, uh, I think it's about time. My husband's retired. I want to spend more time with my grandkids and stuff like that. Let's kind of work in some transition here or something like that. So I think that, that uh, it's just, yeah, the people, I'm blessed with a, a whole crew right now of people that, that are just, I think, wonderful. Uh, I have uh, two chair side assistants. Jamie is uh, uh, an outstanding chair side assistant. She's also a trained EMT, which is really cool to have, uh, you know, and even though we're all uh, CPR certified and stuff like that, she's seriously considered going into hygiene school. She's uh, that. My other chair side assistant, Megan, uh, she's got a bachelor's degree in uh, biology with a minor in chemistry. Uh, just extremely sharp lady. Both of those ladies, I really believe, could be dentists if they could make the time for it. They're, they're just that good and uh, young and smart. Two hygienists that are Cracker Jacks too. And um, I actually have an additional lady up front that is helping Joyce that uh, uh, she's also a registered dental hygienist. So if one of the other hygienists needs to be gone for a little while, uh, she can fill right in then instead of having to reschedule a whole bunch of patients and stuff like that. Willie works great. But how do you, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I've talked to so many dentists over the years, like that they go into a small town, mm -hmm. they buy an office, they fire all the existing staff, um, the whole town in one minute thinks, oh my God, did you hear about, you know, uh, Jerry retired and the new kid uh, came on and the whole <laughs> office quit and they, they can't turn their reputation around for anything. Right. I mean, I've, I've heard so many of these scenarios and I've just said, dude, you know, you, you, you need to just moved to another town. I mean, you, you messed up and, and this is going to, I don't know how you change the opinion of 5,000. I mean, imagine if your whole town wanted to vote for Hillary and uh -huh. your job was to get them to all vote for Trump. I mean, that, that, that's a hard task, uh, if not impossible. And uh, I just, um, <clears throat> but, but again, why, why do you, um, I, I've also seen, you know, dentists who can keep their staff, keep their patients. And, and I'll go into an office and, you know, they'll have some people in there 15, 20, 30 years, and they got a whole bunch of patients that have been with them 15, 20, 30 years. You go into another office across the street that has the same age, and it seems like the, the old staff's been there three years, and they can never keep staff, and they're always marketing. Uh, they're always spending a lot of money on marketing, always getting a lot of new patients, and they just come in the front door, go out the back. Um, what, what, do, what do you think the keys are? of uh, keeping Joyce for 30 years, uh, um, keeping your lab tech brother for those years, uh, keeping patients for life. Because you just can't, in a town of five, in, a, in your small town, you mm -hmm. just can't throw up more billboards and more direct mail. I mean, it just doesn't work in those towns. Right. Um, I think back to your previous question of how, uh, instead of buying a practice, if you would have more of a transition to where a dentist comes in alongside the uh, the senior dentist, which is what I would have been trying to do, but it seems like all the practice brokers want to do a turnkey deal in and out. But I think in a smaller town, if you could have the, the young potential uh, new owner come in and work alongside the other dentist for five years, if the dentist wants to do that, a lot of times guys my age just want to get the heck out of Dodge, which is unfortunate. But I think that would do a lot to smooth that transition over. Um, as far as, you know, being able to make it a smooth transition and the practice be successful for some transition on that aspect of it. Um, 
and then I missed your second question. You got well, back. Well, you, you brought up another point. You know, um, I think that now that we've been doing this three and four decades, um, you know, we got to see, well, how was it, you know, back in the 80s and 70s, mm -hmm. and how, how is it now? And, and I think that the, uh, the consultants um, getting all the selling dentists to do a turnkey and, now, and being financed by a bank, and so they can just get their big, fat commission check right now, and it's really, um, really hurt the the industry. It, it's probably helped it in uh, in some ways, like liquidity. But back in the old day, the owner would carry. So you know, if I buy a hundred thousand dollar home and finance it for thirty years, I'm going to pay hundred thousand for the home and two hundred thousand interest. I mean, a lot of these guys will buy a uh, ten thousand dollar car, but they'll finance it five years and pay thirty thousand dollars to a ten thousand car. The dentist used to get twice as much of their practice because the owner would carry. So the young kid would come in, I'm going to finance this to you. I'm selling my practice for 500000 and I'm going to carry this thing at 10% interest for seven years. So 10% interest for seven years, they're almost getting twice as much money for their practice. But what I liked about it is the seller had skin in the game, which was so important for the rule because if he knew <clears throat> you're a city slicker, you're shady, you come off bad, you're, you're not going to make it here in Parsons, Kansas. So he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't sell to someone who needed to go to a different community. And, uh, and then when he was in the game, he's incentivized. So he was at the shopping mall, he's at church, he's at the bowling alley. He's like, oh yeah, that new kid is amazing. It's amazing all the new stuff they learn in school and he's the great guy and you know, I highly recommend him. I, I really like the old school way better. I think, uh, I, I, I think uh, owner carry and having skin in the game was, is so much uh, more effective. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a kid walk out of school $350,000 in debt by some big million dollar practice for $700,000 and be completely um, wasted. You know, the whole thing's upside down and it's a disaster a year later. And the dentist who sold it to him is, is retired in some beach community in Florida. And it's like, this is just, you know, and he won selling, the broker won, the, you know, and, uh, and the dentist lost. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just the stress of that debt, uh, I think can cause a lot of issues, you know, as far as health and stuff like that and relationships with your family and wife. I mean, if you've got all this bearing on you and, and things like that and your wife's done without for all these times and she wants a few things too, the financial burden of that can, can really be overwhelming. Absolutely. What, what other advice would you give on these kids? Um, some things, uh, not so much dentistry, but uh, life in general is uh, raising kids. Things that I've found out is that uh, one is, you know, you hear people say, well, I spend quality time with the kids. I think that Zig Ziglar once said that you spell quality by quantity, uh, the amount of time you can spend. Um, I didn't really get that so much on my first one. The, uh, the second one, it really was driven home to me more and I worked on that. So I think that you know, take time for your kids, kind of like Kyle said that, you know, now that he has three kids, he can't be running off. He chooses not to be running off to seminars and stuff like that because his kids are important to him. I think that's great. Um, Joe uh, Kelly, the other guy, we may have lunch with him this weekend, but we're not going to go out. We're probably going to get pizzas and carry them over to his house and so they can be with their kids and stuff like that. I think spending time with your kids is important. I think that uh, this is something that's uh, kind of interesting. Uh, my sister was a uh, middle school girls physical education coach for over 20 years and she said that one thing that she noticed with uh, little girls coming into middle school, the ones that had been through gymnastics were so much further ahead physically, just in ability to walk and carry themselves and stuff like that. And she said that that stayed with those kids and she followed those kids on through and they were all good performers in school. They may have not been straight A's and stuff like that, but just the coordination early in their career and stuff like that. I think if I was a high school football coach, I'd get every four-year-old boy enrolled in gymnastics because uh, up through middle school, probably the girls uh, are as good or better than the guys just from developing the coordination and stuff earlier. Uh, it's amazing, but I never thought of that until she mentioned it. But uh, get those kids in gymnastics. That would be something, I think. I decided not to have any children, and my four boys are not taking it well. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I feel like the luckiest man in the world. Like today, I, you know, it's a Wednesday, and I got to have lunch with three of my four boys. I mean, it's just uh, it, 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 it's everything. And uh, the older you get, you realize uh, nothing else really matters except uh, 
kids, the families, the brothers, the sisters. And, and seeing them grow and become responsible adults, I think that that's uh, a big up for, for parents and stuff, at least from my point of view. So what did, what did you, why did you do uh, volunteer dentistry in third world countries? And, and what, what did that, did you see anything that you didn't think, uh, did, did it change your mind? Was it just curiosity? Did it make you come back and think differently about uh, uh, your home country, your hometown? Oh, uh, yeah, a couple of experiences with that. All the three, three of the four, uh, I'm sorry, two of the three dental experiences were kind of church related. Uh, just a group at our church uh, heard of a, a little uh, clinic in Haiti that could use some help. So uh, they put together a group of physicians, dentists, and just people. We went down there and uh, we worked down there for a couple of years uh, just seeing the abject poverty of, of, of people. At, uh, when I first came back from my first trip down there, seeing somebody just drive by in an old beat up car thinking that the shelter they had in that car was better than the vast majority of the people that we saw in, in these little towns in, in uh, Haiti. And uh, the one thing that really drove home the difference was that uh, uh, in this clinic one evening a group of people brought in a lady on a homemade stretcher that was uh, extremely pregnant and extremely toxemic and the, the two physicians that were in our group uh, worked for 12 hours trying to save this lady and her child uh, were unsuccessful in both uh, attempts on that but uh, what impressed me about that was that uh, 16 years before that uh, my wife had the same issue with uh, our oldest daughter and so she gets shipped to Columbia we have a healthy baby that is now a uh, like I said a uh, associate legal counsel for United Missouri Bank and the only difference was the availability of health care and medicine what was kind of interesting about that case was that the two physicians working on the lady in Haiti, one of them was the uh, physician that was my daughter's uh, obstetrician, my wife's obstetrician. The other was my daughter's grandfather. So uh, to have that parallelism was uh, really made me appreciate what we do have around here. Another instance was uh, we went on a well drilling trip, which really didn't have anything to do with uh, drilling on teeth or anything like that. But uh, for fresh water in Central America, is it a premium? One of the guys who was spearheading that trip uh, told us a story that when he was down on a previous trip, a person, one of the local people, uh, called him aside and said, I have a question for you. I heard a rumor that I really can't believe that it's true, but I wanted to ask you just in case. And he said, Sure, what is it? He said, uh, the local guy said, I heard that the United States is so rich that they flush their toilets with fresh water. And it hit the guy and he said, that's true. That, you know, these people that don't even have access to fresh water, and we hit the flush the toilet without even thinking about it. Uh, and I'm not saying don't do that, but to see what people are getting by with and what we take for granted has really been a impactful uh, thing to me that you really, what do you need and what do you want? It's, uh, that's what I ask myself. And I don't need nearly as much as uh, what I want. I remember the first time I took my boys to a missionary dental trip uh, down into Mexico. And they must have been, I don't know, one, three, five, six, or whatever. But the oldest boy, Eric, I'm thinking he was six or seven. But uh, we're down there and there's, you know, 5,000 people, dirt floors, no running water, no electricity, whatever. And Eric looks around and he, and he looks at it and he goes, Daddy, how come they don't have trampolines? <laughs> and I thought, wow. Because, yeah. you know, in the backyard, that was yeah. their main thing was the trampoline. It was, they, they had more fun on that than the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And he just couldn't believe that there was a whole village down here and none of these kids had a trampoline. Right. And they're happy. You know, yeah. that's thing you know they're really happy yeah so um i um i remember the first time i did a missionary deal it was uh it was so good for me because i i had uh kids i had a practice i you know you just think you had all this stress in the world and you just you know you get out your little miniature violin and play your you know feel sorry for myself and then you go down there and you see all these people living with virtually nothing and they're all happy 
Yeah. And for me, it's always uh, extremely spiritual uh, to go, and it makes you get back on the, the meaning of life. I mean, I, I and, uh, you know, I, I remember in um, some cities where, you know, as soon as the light goes down, there's no light because they don't have any electricity. Mm -hmm. And right. they just throw a match in the 50-gallon barrel where the, all the trash is, and they break out a soccer ball, and someone's got a boom box with the radios, and they're having more fun and giggling and laughing uh, than they are on my street where everybody's inside on air conditioners, on Facebook, on, you know, watching Netflix, whatever. And I just thought these people were having more quality of life, more fun, more everything. Uh, I, I got to ask you, I gotta, um, I'm out of time. It's been our hour. That was an awesome hour. I want to ask you one question you don't have to answer because you're never supposed to talk about religion, sex, politics, <laughs> violence. But um, these are strange political times for us. Uh -huh. And you and I, um, you know, I can remember the first election I was really paid attention to was, you know, Jimmy Carter, then, you know, uh, uh, Reagan and all, all these. Uh, but um, why do you, why do you, do you think politics is more strange now than when you got out of dental school 40 years ago? Uh, or do you think, or, or have you seen this bird before? Uh, I, I, it's definitely strange this time around, especially when we have a, uh, pretty much a, a non-politician on one side running against a, a pretty much politician on the other side. I remember it's been probably 10 or 15 years ago uh, on 60 Minutes, Andy Rooney had, uh, do you remember Andy Rooney on? Oh, yeah. He was yeah. great, but one of his, uh, it was like a chalk talk and, and his uh, whole subject was he felt that instead of having presidential elections, we should just hire the CEO of one of the top Fortune 500 companies, and he'd pay, put him on commission. And then you know, he had all these numbers about doing this, paying him this, and yeah, you could pay him, uh, you know, ten times what the president's making, but make him earn it, you know. So I'm wondering, you know, maybe as you know, the two candidates have a lot that you know the press and everybody chooses not to look at, but I'm wondering if maybe someone that's coming at it from a business point of view might be worth a shot. I mean, the politicians over the last couple hundred years really have, haven't done real well, so maybe let's, let's give a guy a shot. I, you know, that's just my two cents worth on that. Just a little bit different, but it's business. You know, the United States government is a big business, so maybe if we had a businessman calling the shots, it might make a difference. It's, a, it's the biggest business in the world. I mean, there's no $19 trillion business anywhere else but the United States of America. I mean, it's truly, truly amazing, and it'll be a... Uh, Weird one to watch. Um, mm -hmm. What makes me nervous is, um, I'll just end on this. Um, you know, I've, I've seen this bird before where whenever a very stable country, whether it be Italy or Greece or Germany or whatever, whenever the people um, are this riled up, usually um, the economy was not on stable grounds. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, it, it was a disaster. And, you know, the... Um, in MBA school, I mean, you know, it's, it's common, you know, average recessions every eight years. Well, it was eight years ago on the 2008 meltdown, and now right. it's eight years later, and all, even, even though the numbers look good on paper, um, I, I kind of equate it to, um, I'm looking at, at a herd of sheep, and there, I, I, and, you know, you see 5% unemployment, you see billing 200,000 jobs a year, you see the debt on the balance sheet's only one year's GDP, and you don't see anything wrong in any of the numbers, and, and you look at you know, compare the United States to Haiti or Africa or Asia or whatever. I mean, we're just, you know, we're just Beverly Hills, but the sheep are all making noise and they're not eating and they're, they're, they're being all antsy. There's a little wolf walking around in there and they see it and the macroeconomics people don't see it. So I, I'm a little nervous just the fact that every time I've seen a, a, a country with a great economy getting this riled up and putting up these kinds of uh, rhetoric and and the way they're talking and all that stuff like that. The the sheep are restless, so I think the sheep are seeing something that the macroeconomic numbers are not seeing. I think there's a lot more insecurity when, amongst the individuals when they look at their their job forecast, their debt structure, their whatever the collective masses are looking at. They're not nearly as happy as what the macroeconomists economists are looking at. So there's something going on. There's something yeah. going on. I agree with that. But uh, 
Jerry, thank you so much for 40 years of service to your patients. It's great talking to a UMKC alum. Thanks for being a townie since basically day one. Uh, I just thank the world to you. And uh, gosh, kids, if you learned anything from this, uh, um, go rule. I mean, I, one, of my, one of my classmates uh, at a UMKC, he wanted to live in downtown LA, but he knew he'd never make any money there. So he set up a practice four 10-hour days at Bakersfield. And he's done so well in Bakersfield that then at the end of uh, Thursday night, he gets in his nice car or his airplane and goes down into his condo in L.A. So he lives like a rock star on the beach in L.A. <laughs> Thursday or uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But he goes back to Bakersfield and does four tens because he knew that, you know, the, the beach didn't need another dentist for, the, for another decade. Uh, right. But he knew Bakersfield needed one. And I, I saw that all the time. I mean, the, the dentist had would set up in uh, – um, Beverly Hills or LA looking out of the ocean were literally, you know, barely um, paying their bills, but the ones who drove an hour inland were just crushing it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to get you on, Jerry, just because you're a great guy. Uh, but, you know, I'm, these, these kids got to go rural. They got to go rural. Kansas yeah. City doesn't need another dentist. <laughs> yeah. If, I mean, I'd be happy. I'm actually on the Minters program through Dentaltown and uh, I've got plenty of room for more, so if there's anybody else that wants to chime in or get my two cents worth, I'd be happy to help out any way I can. All right, buddy. Thank you for all you do. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.